Hyperloop One, transforming uh, transportation, which is alliterative in so many ways. Please welcome to the stage Rob Lloyd, who's the CEO, and Daryl Etherington, my husband. Thank you. Thanks, Jordan. Hey, Rob. Whoop. How you doing? Pretty good. Yourself? Excellent. Enjoying the traffic? Yeah, yeah. Loving the traffic. So you can help with that, right? We're trying, and uh, <laughs> I think uh, Las Vegas is a uh, walking use case is a place that does require a Hyperloop. Yeah, and, and in fact, you guys are already underway building uh, the first uh, at scale test track here in Nevada, right? Yeah, just about 33 miles from where we're sitting right now, we have uh, a full scale uh, test under construction. Uh, probably in the next couple of months, we'll be able to show the world that the idea of Hyperloop is real at scale. Um, we also uh, did our motor test in May, and we've moved on from that to actually continue to innovate very rapidly on the propulsion system. Uh, we are going to show the world that Hyperloop is real, and so far we're seeing interest from around the globe actually coming our way because we all have some transportation challenges we want to solve. Yes, that's true. It's a problem anyone can sort of sympathize with, right, regardless of where you are. Uh, I think just getting back to the test track here. So you said within a couple months. So that means that you'll have an active test of the finished uh, test track within a couple months? Yeah, absolutely. And, and one of the things that Josh Geigel has done, who's our co-founder and uh, president of engineering, is he's actually looked at the speed with which his team is innovating, the speed with which we're continuing to develop some of the key uh, technology. So we're going to build out a certain amount, finish that, run the test, then continue to deploy the next version of whether it's the motor or the track or some of the methods and techniques we're using in, in construction so that we're constantly kind of doing a DevOps model but for hardware and each one of those build outs will incorporate further innovations in the, in the cycle that his, his team is focused on. So, you know, we're up to 225 people. Uh, we were less than 100 when we were here at CES last year. We'll be over 500 uh, when we come back to CES next year. Uh, and uh, the pace has been very, very exciting, but uh, I think the product is equally exciting. And the fact Hyperloop is going to be real, the world's going to see it, and uh, I think there's a lot of people looking forward to that. Great. So, so what can we expect then? What, what we're going to expect this this trial to look like once it actually, the, when the first one goes down? What yeah, kind of so technology goals do you have? It's a test of the architecture. It's a test of the technology, and we're not going to have people in it. Okay. Uh, it's going to be accelerating very quickly over. 300 plus meters of our latest version of the motor, uh, and then it'll be stopping very quickly, uh, and then we'll expand that and do further testing over years, actually. So we'll be in a test and development mode for a long period of time, um, but we'll show the levitation, we'll show the track, the guidance, the propulsion system, and its uh, electronics and power management systems, which have continued uh, to be uh, very exciting work that's going on. It's kind of like flipping a data center on and off with, uh, in, in a very, very fast sequence, and that technology is proving uh, actually very exciting, and there's nothing like it in the world where you're flipping six to eight megawatts on and off uh, in a very, very short period of time as the pod travels over that. So no people in it. There'll be a test that includes the sled that will look a little bit like the May test of our, of our propulsion system, and then we'll also have a pod which will test the aerodynamic ca capabilities inside the pressure reduced environment. So we're installing the, the vacuum system now, the welding's underway, the track's being uh, deployed, and I guess once we're pretty sure that we're ready to rock and roll, then we'll give you a call and want you to drive up the road here and, and uh, visit us. All right, that sounds great. And is it, the pods are, are sort of just pods that are demoed pods, or are they the, the kind of design you would imagine uh, people being able to use are cargo specific? Yeah, the, the test pods that Josh's team are developing we'll have the aerodynamics required to be able to move at the speeds that we're designing for, which is over 700 miles an hour. Uh, and in this one will go 700? No, we won't no. be going okay. that fast <laughs> because you just need more distance yeah. to keep going that quickly. And what we do want to do as we continue to achieve higher speeds, we'll be incorporating cost-reduced versions of the technology because this is really about two things. We know we can do this. Yeah. Uh, so what we're really innovating around are the methods to actually construct and the materials we're using because we need to hit a cost point, so we're going to be three times more effective than any other transportation technology on the ground today. And I think the three times more effective, whether that's three times faster or three times cheaper or three times greener, mm. I think that's going to create the breakthrough to create 
this transformation that the world is hoping for, and I do believe the market is there uh, for us to actually make something very, very special happen in the next five years. Great, so actually you, that cut brings up my next question because cost is kind of, seems like possibly your greatest concern. Like I think you guys have done very well at raising, you've raised quite a bit of money, but all that money goes pretty quickly when you're doing the kind of basic research and like development that you guys are doing. So how do you get to the point, you mentioned a, a few years out before we're looking at anything that's sort of commercially active, right? Or, or at least transporting passengers. No, I think your question is very good. So we've raised $160 million so far, yeah. and, and recently, I think in October, when we announced that Brent Klinikas had joined us, uh, former CFO at Uber, uh, treasurer at Google, and it's been a long time at Microsoft, he had joined our company. We also announced we'd raised $50 million, so that was our latest raise, uh, which was part of our program, which will be our Series C. Mm. So I can tell you that we'll be beginning uh, the effort to uh, close our Series C, several hundred million dollars, but to your point, that's all to actually move to the next level of commercialization of the technology, right. and that's actually, you know, it's a, it, we're not really using a lot of debt, so we're actually using equity to finance a lot of capital. Uh, so in order to really make this scale, we are working with projects and customers around the world that would take a route and then we'll work with them very closely and with the regulators and with, uh, with the actual customers and really make them part, the next part of our development process and, and spread that out around the opportunities that we see around the world. So a couple hundred million dollars is our goal in the first half of this year yeah. in our Series C. And we're also now starting to see interest around the world to really partner with a customer to build the first of the production legs of a Hyperloop and that's why we're pretty excited about what we saw in the Global Challenge, which we announced last May. Right, so talking about the Global Challenge, you also announced an update to that today. You've got, uh, you've, you're down to the 35 semifinalists, and you've got some locations chosen. Can you give us a bit more detail on sort of what that looks like now? Yeah, so when we were here and, and we were uh, showing the world the first propulsion system, it was outdoor, and, and we also announced at that time that we were looking for the best ideas in the world, uh, whether it was cities, countries, teams, that wanted a Hyperloop to come to their country. Uh, so we actually had 2,800 people registered and said, hey, I'd like to be involved. We had some, we had, you know, some really serious uh, submissions. Uh, they worked with our transportation economists, they worked with our engineering team, uh, and we just shortlisted down to 35 semifinalists that we want to do more work with because these are actually really, really viable routes. We had the entire company took the afternoon and and got together and, and reviewed and discussed and thought about these projects and we maybe thought we could get it down to a smaller number, but we do have 35 projects, six continents, we didn't get one from the subarctic or Antarctica, but uh, hey, maybe they don't have internet yet. So we're pretty excited about that and we'll be working with those in three global workshops that we're gonna kick off starting in February, so in India, we're going to have a workshop in February, then we're going to do one in DC. I was super pumped to see some submissions from the US because it's been kind of quiet here mm. uh, relative to what Hyperloop seems to mean to everyone else around the world. I keep wondering why do people in the US not feel as strongly do about a transformation? Do you have any guesses about why? What's that? Do you have any guesses about why? Um, I think it, it's okay for people to now realize that this is a moonshot, but it's going to happen and it's more real than people thought when Elon put the paper out and had both those that imagined it was very exciting and those that wanted to doubt and criticize. Yeah. So uh, US, Canada, Australia, uh, Northern Europe, uh, India, all around the world. Then we're gonna have a session in London and by the time we get through that process, our objective is let's, let's bring it down to a smaller number and then work with those projects and the governments that are fully supportive to take them to the next level, which means a deeper level of engineering study and some serious work on financing the projects that come as a result of those studies. How, how deeply did that factor in? So when you got these submissions, you were looking at them, how, many, how much of that is like, well, these people will be able to help us with the goal of achieving that next level financially? Like realistically, they, can, they yeah, have the I, funds. I think we can help them achieve the next level financially, which is project financing to manage to actually finance viable infrastructure projects. Um, and that's actually work we're doing now, and Brent Klinikas has really helped that, having invested in some of those projects when he was the treasurer at Google. 
Uh, so what we're looking at now is to say not only one with those new projects that we identified through the Global Challenge, but the other seven that have already gone through uh, a preliminary or, or entering a secondary phase, what is it that makes a good project? Yeah. First of all, it's on a route that makes good uh, economic sense. We had some ideas, they made sense, they were kind of interesting to the community, but there wasn't really the economic viability of building infrastructure that would have to generate revenue. Which is not to say that that will always be the case, it's just right now with the cost that you would associate with building a project like that, it doesn't make sense. Well, we don't want to wait for a government to come and go through a 15 to 20 year process to say they want to do this. We'd rather build a public-private partnership. We'd rather look at uh, different ways in which infrastructure can be built. Mm -hmm. We've learned a lot from solar farms and wind farms in terms of how you can abs actually introduce this technology in a different way instead of just waiting for the government to come up with an idea, it takes too long. Yeah. So we want great routes that make economic sense. We want routes in which the regulators and governments are supportive instead of, let's say, uh, blocking what we're trying to achieve. And if someone's blocking what we're trying to achieve and wants to just put the straight arm out and make it hard for us, we're just gonna go to another country because there's interest everywhere. And we don't need to fight with a regulator, we'd rather work with a regulator to write new regulations that don't exist because there is no book about how you regulate a Hyperloop. There's, there's books about the airplanes and cars and they're struggling now to even keep up with the autonomous car. Yeah, yeah. So imagine when you get a train and a plane and an autonomous vehicle all into one, there are regulators who want to work with us and actually write new regulations. That's what we're doing in Dubai uh, with the Road and Transport Authority there who are working together with us mm -hmm. to actually understand what it would take to certify and regulate a Hyperloop. And that's pretty exciting stuff. And then finally, so great routes that make economic sense, governments that want us that aren't going to try to block us. And the final thing is projects that can be financed, where there's capital, where there's a government or a private public partnership mechanism, because we're going to be building something that hasn't happened before. And our goal is very clear. We want three of these in operation by 2021. So that's only five years from today. So we can't let this just flow the way infrastructure normally flows. We're doing it differently. And I think so far uh, we feel pretty good about where we're headed. Great. I think actually, can you give us an update then on, on some of those other projects you mentioned that are already in progress and that are the likely candidates for that hitting that goal? Yeah, one of the first ones that we announced was a project together with a, a really great uh, partners in Northern Europe uh, called FS Links. Uh, Finland to Sweden yep. uh, Links. And it was the idea was to connect Helsinki and Stockholm and the, and the cities along the way. That's a fairly uh, low density population with a large geographic region. Uh, very significant interest, especially from the Finnish, Finnish government, which is struggling to find the innovation to replace some of the Nokia fallout that's occurred in the marketplace. So that one is, is something that we're working with the government, having conversations about what we could do together. We're seeing other countries in Northern Europe that are also very interested, and you'll hear more about that shortly. We've done a study and we're in the midst of a study with DP World, who were our largest investor in our latest round of financing, and are the operator of the third largest port called the Port of Jebel Ali, to, to actually examine a hyperloop that would move containers directly from the dock 32 miles inland and actually create a dry dock in the desert rather than using expensive real estate that's mostly been reclaimed as you know, in Dubai. Yeah. And uh, we have another project underway ex as well in Los Angeles and Long Beach, looking at the opportunity to get some of those trucks off the 410 uh, and 705 and make it uh, available for people to drive because right now it's a really, it's the worst uh, highway experience in the United States because there's just no other way to get the containers that are offloading from, from that port uh, to the Inland Empire and elsewhere. So you'll see more of the results of those studies uh, probably in the next uh, 60 days. Okay, and those are all proceeding sort of on your desired targets and, and everything, your, your yeah, timelines. Let's be, yeah, let's be clear, we're not in the business to do studies, we're in the business to build a hyperlink. Right, yeah. But the way you do that is you have to create an economic case that makes sense, you have to do some preliminary engineering, you have to identify the right of way and the routes that, that could be obtained, and you have to have a government that's cheering you on and trying to make things happen instead of it making it difficult. And I can tell you, uh, they're out there because even our experience in Nevada, where we were able to get the, uh, the approvals to construct what we are constructing today, we got that done in two months. Um, and if you said, what would it take to have the state uh, uh, government, 
um, the people that actually would be required to approve a transportation corridor, the Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, it got done in two months. Yeah. So you can get it done when people want to get it done. And Nevada has been a tremendous experience for us. We've got, uh, I think we've got over 50 people here now, uh, new, new jobs we've created in the state. So the fallout of Hyperloop is we create jobs, we build new infrastructure, we improve economies, we redefine how cities can be defined. You could live 300 miles from your, where your job is if there's a Hyperloop, and that redefines how all of you that come from San Francisco, right, and that expensive real estate and increasingly difficult balance of work and, and, and travel uh, could be redefined. So historically, all of us have felt okay if we were 30 minutes from our work. That goes back to the agrarian societies. If you could walk 30 minutes and get to a farm, you could work on that farm. Now 30 minutes, when I was a kid, took us to the suburbs. But 30 minutes today, the highways are clogged, so it's gone to an hour and a half. So a hyperloop could take the distance, the diameter of a metro area from 20 miles to 300 miles, and you could still be at your office in 30 minutes. That's completely redefining real estate, defining how our, how our cities are built in the future, and that's what governments get. They actually get this as a great big deal because we do want to live in the world's greatest cities and work there. There's so many jobs are being created, but it's getting too expensive. But doesn't it also sound like, it sounds like it's incredibly transformative, right? But doesn't that then become a liability potentially later on? Like when regulators see kind of the impact that you're having, if you, if you get to market and you're doing this stuff, are you not afraid that they're going to be, they're going to become kind of bitten by the, by the speed with which things are changing and then maybe kind of peel back and, and start instituting more Well, it's kind of like broadband, you know, when, when I was in the networking business, uh, and Singapore was out there putting 100 gigs of broadband when some countries, like this one, were putzing around with... Canada, too. Which is Canada, right? right? I'm Canadian, so yeah. Oh, me too. All right. Putzing around <laughs> with very low bandwidth. And you had a Singapore, and then you had northern European countries that just said, look, this makes a difference. Yeah. And if you looked at that over 20 years, the broadband that was put in place in the leaders made a difference. They attracted the data centers, they got the jobs, and people are actually seeing that transportation infrastructure should be the broadband of the next 20 years. Uh, we take it for granted that what we have today available on our mobile phones and the bandwidth we have at home, but it wasn't taken for granted 20 years ago. So I actually think transportation and high-speed transportation is embraced by governments. They just, they just think the way to do it is look at a high-speed rail or have some project that goes on forever and we're trying to rewrite those rules and make something happen in five years that might have taken 20. Yeah. And uh, that's why we're all so excited to be at Hyperloop and try to make this, uh, this great vision really, really real, really, really quick. Great. I think just before we go, I, one question that comes to mind, given uh, Shervin, your, your partner Shervin there, and his political affiliations with the Clintons, like, do, are you at all worried that under a Trump administration that might impact your ability to have a sort of friendly relationship with government here in the US? No, we're going to have a friendly relationship with the government in the U.S. As a matter of fact, um, we expect that the new Secretary of Transport is going to be very interested in the impact of having a U.S. company that's building transformational infrastructure, creating U.S. jobs. We've just created 50 here. Uh, we could be creating thousands of jobs in the U.S. I think we are one of the best plays in the infrastructure investment that will occur in the United States over the next few decades. So not worried about that at all. As a matter of fact, I'm pretty pumped about once I think uh, the transportation secretary gets in her seat, I think we're going to be one of the coolest things for her to spend her time with, as Secretary Fox had with us uh, while he was the secretary of transportation of the DOT. All right, great. Thanks very much for joining us. Thanks for having me.